Hi, I'm James from Chaosium. I sat down with Lynn Hardy, who is an associate editor for Call of Cthulhu and the line editor for the Rivers of London role-playing game. We talked about creating investigators. There's an art to building a good character, not just in a mechanical sense, but also in a way that makes them easy to integrate with a campaign and just exciting and enjoyable for everybody to have around. Lynn shares some tips about how to make the best Call of Cthulhu investigators, and talks about everything from stat spreads to just the way that they balance with the rest of the group. I'll jump across the interview in just a moment, but first, please remember to subscribe, and thanks for watching. A good character is one that can get involved in the plot, uh, in the, se the sense of Call of Cthulhu, who leaves themselves wide open to get tooled over, basically. So, you know, an interesting range of skills, um, a willingness to do really stupid things that you know in, you know, in person that you wouldn't do, um, because obviously with Call of Cthulhu, it's a horror game. There has to be a certain level of buy-in. There has to be a certain level of investigator stupidity. Otherwise, you would just go home and have a nice cup of tea and some biscuits. Um, so what you're really looking for in a good investigator is something that's going to be fun, something that someone who is going to throw themselves into the plot and be engaged with it, because that's the way you're going to get the most enjoyment out of the story, is taking part in it having an influence on it, helping decide which direction it goes in. Context is always a critical thing. And there's no real way to say, what kind of character should you generally make in Call of Cthulhu? But that said, because it kind of can be useful to have a general idea, even if it's not always going to be right. When you're sitting down to a table, what kind of characters do you think of, or do you have a way that you kind of look around at the others and build based on what they're doing? What are your strategies? terrible for basically waiting to see what everybody else has got and then filling in the gaps to make sure that we're covered um it's something i tend to do when people ask when we're doing LARPs. um you know what sort of character do you want to play it was all what character do you need me to play um and that's often been my strategy with role playing games is like let people who got a really firm idea of who who their character should be go with that and then i will quite happily as I said, fill in the gaps or look at something that, you know, if the gaps are already filled, well, what else can I do that's interesting that will bring added dimension and depth or cause additional mischief, let's face it. Um, as my background was as a research scientist uh, in biomedical sciences, I try to avoid those characters um, because that really used to, well not so much these days but obviously at one point it was a bit of a busman's holiday for somebody who might be kind of new to call of cthulhu and might not be super familiar with the archetypes when you sit down at a table what are the different kind of general ideas that you're looking for what do you see so that you can play off against it the thing you've got to think about really is do you want to be a subject specialist or do you want to be a jack of all trades because that's going to influence how you spend your skill points and your personal interest points. If you want to be a specialist in a very specific area, then you're going to have a, a very small number of very high value skills. If you want to be a jack of all trade, you're going to spread your points out along a wide variety of skills, which means none of your skill values are necessarily gonna be very high, but it means that overall, you've probably got more of a chance to get involved doing more things. And that's the sort of thing you've you've got to look at and think about, you know, which are you going to enjoy more? Are you going to enjoy being able to dive in at any opportunity or do you want to wait so you've got your specific moment in the sun where, you know, you're going to come in and you're going to make your role and you're going to dazzle everybody with your subject specialty uh, knowledge. So, yeah, I mean, that's a very important consideration. Do you want big skill values, but not very many of them? Or do you want a lot of middling skill values and, you know, just the chance to, to bimble in and, and do your worst or best, hopefully? When we talk about playing effectively, we'll often mention try and be as involved as you can and, and buy into the story. Um, it's a little different, though, when you are creating characters to do that rather than twisting any character that you're provided with or any character that you've made to to do that for you uh taking call of cthulhu as an example what 
what of the classic investigator archetypes do you think is is the 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 best character before obviously the player skill is applied to it i mean it it depends on which scenario you're going for it's the how long is a piece of string question really isn't it dilettantes are always great because they have an excuse to spend extravagantly getting you to the places that you need to be they also have an excuse for having a weird collection of eclectic skills private investigators are always useful because they have those investigative and research skills. Um, it never hurts to have a doctor of medicine or a nurse with you because let's face it, things are going to get quite squishy. Um, so, but I think really you need to have a look at what scenarios your keeper is planning on running. And, and overall, the best way to create investigators is to have what we call a session zero these days. So it's where you know your keepers decided which campaign or which scenario they're going to do. There's no pregens provided. You get together before the game begins and you collaboratively create interesting characters who will work well together and complement each other. Because one of the worst things that can happen is obviously, you know, if a keeper says, oh, just create anything you want, that's decision paralysis oh my god what do i choose what what is going to be best and people do panic about spending their you know their points incorrectly uh, or you know because they they're worried that they're going to invest them in a skill that never actually comes up which is why in the scenarios we now put useful skills useful occupations to try and guide people so that they can tailor that and have less of that anxiety about spending things incorrectly so if you get together and the GM talks to you about, well, this is the type of campaign, these are the sort of investigator um, occupations that would be really helpful. You know, it would be a good idea if at least one of you had this skill or this skill and then just work together to create a team of people that have got all the bases covered, really, in terms of the, the basic skills. I mean, certainly... Um, when I'm running games at conventions, I also like to give people 70 extra points to spend on pregens, but I don't necessarily expect them to spend them there and then right at the beginning. They can bank them. So if there's something comes up, they can do the whole, oh, well, here's something about my character you didn't know. Back when I was doing this, I actually learned how to be an expert horse rider, say, for example, and then they put their, sp their skill points into that. Um, so, you know, you can do various different things to help ease player anxiety about misspending skill points. And of course, the joy of Call of Cthulhu is that you always have a base stat, you know, base value. Technically, everybody can do everything, just not necessarily very well. And the number of times I've seen at a table where someone's gone, oh, can I try talking, you know, um, Hindustani? And it's like, yeah, why not? You've got 1%. And then they make that roll. <laughs> You know, it's without fail. Um, so, yes, group character creation really helps get a handle on useful characters. And once you've got a useful character, you can build interest into them in terms of their background and how they got those skills. It also gives you um, opportunities in any scenario or campaign you're playing because you know you've got at least something that is going to be useful to that game and get you in there and get you um, steering the plot in the direction that you want it to go. What do you think about exotic occupations for investigators? They are at the same time some of the most exciting things. So if you are looking for a character who's going to be invested, it's a great way. But I personally, and I've mentioned this in other interviews, always struggle to bring a pilot into a game unless I'm yanking them out of their plane and not really giving them a chance to have that specialty moment. Again, this is why is Session Zero is useful. Like, is there going to be a use for a pilot in that game? Do they need to fly anywhere? Can the pilot borrow a plane from whoever it is they work for to get them somewhere? But if you want to play a pilot, why not? Um, perhaps they're on leave. Perhaps they're recovering from an injury or, or a crash even, let's face it. There were an awful lot of plane crashes in the 20s. Um, perhaps they're between jobs. You know, maybe they were a pilot. They're currently unemployed. That's how they get involved with these investigators because really they've got nothing better to do with their time. So would you apply that same principle to 
it's all of the more exotic occupations that you can find in the keepers and investigators books it's certainly one way of doing it um i mean quite often um you'll i mean certainly in things like children of fear some of the pre-gen several of them have been soldiers in world war one so you've got that option as well it's like is this something that they were doing so it's informed all of their skills but technically they're not doing that anymore because that job is no longer available that situation has changed but because that's the way you created the character it's just a label that's who they were it's not necessarily who they're now going to be so yes i mean you can certainly do things with that with with soldier it's like that was my previous career i've been demobbed now i'm looking for something else but that's what all my skills are when we talk about moments in the sun and having these very powerful investigators in a specific field, it can stray a little bit into the min maxi kind of territory. And I think that Call of Cthulhu is to a certain extent resistant to min maxing just because it's, it's not a, a super strategic combat game and monsters can just steamroll you no matter how many points you have in something. But are, are there any, home rules or suggestions or guides or anything that you apply to some of the more uh, fighting based skills or finance based skills like credit rating anything like that mike's going to shoot me because i never find credit rating all that useful uh, and yet I, I always have to go back and remind myself to include it in characters when i'm writing them in games um so yeah i mean credit rating can have its uses but it's one of those it's I hate to say dump skill, but kind of it's the one that always gets forgotten about because it's kind of like it doesn't always crop up that often in games. Most people hand wave that, although it, it can be useful depending on um, what your situation and backing is. It's it's probably more useful in games like Gaslight Regency to a certain extent, where your social class is going to have more of an influence on whether somebody will actually speak to you or not. But really weird skills like Cthulhu mythos you can't start with it you can't buy points in it that's something you get by encountering the mythos so possibly the most power gamey skill the rule is already there to stop you from really getting it unless your keeper agrees because they have a specific reason why they want you to already know that um it may be to do with a campaign. It may be that that's how they want to hook all the characters into knowing each other, that they've all had a strange experience and that's how they've been brought together. Um, but really, I think as long as the player can justify to the keeper why their character has that ridiculously high skill, and of course, if I remember right, nothing can start above 90 anyway, um, you've why not let people have it if that's what's going to help them play their character that's great and you know it never hurts to have a tank um there's certainly i know the number of boxes i've written in various scenarios and campaigns now you like think about the threat level are your characters all academics or are they more physically inclined because if they're academics you need to think about this threat level if they're all gun bunnies you need to set it at this threat level. So, like you said, if if a player can justify it in terms of their character's background and experience, I don't see that there's going to be a problem. And if it's something that's going to wreck the campaign, and maybe the keeper just needs to get a little bit creative about how they how they deal with that, and that helps the keeper become more creative. Saying no is a horrible thing to do to a player unless they just use it to try and completely win. I'm going to win. And it's just like, maybe you need to have a conversation with them at that point that this is not, not a winning game. Here's a question that has a few sides to it. Is it's difficult from a design perspective and a keeper perspective and a player perspective. Do you have a preference around character generation methods so for, for rolling all of the characteristics or using quick fire stats or using one of the arrays do you have any advice around which people might want to select or look at to get the best outcomes i think if you've not played call of cthulhu before and or you're new to role playing i think the quick stat generation is the best way to go it's fast it means you end up with a character quickly you're not having to do any mental arithmetic at the table you're not having to spend ages figuring things out um and you can again you can specialize or you can go for an even spread and 
you know the various books give you hints on t and tips on how to do that so i think for beginners um people who are less confident that's a great way to go um i always like rolling up characters i've got numerous dice next to my desk so that if i need to create anything for a campaign i can just grab those and roll them i mean not that i don't cheat um you know there's the certain values just don't make sense they're just like no we're not having those i know i'm notorious for letting players re-roll their luck values at tables if they get less than 40 percent, 45 percent, because you know <laughs> what's the point um so if you like spending time and you've got the time in your session zero or however you want to do this to use the dice and to roll up characters, then go for that. I'm always quite happy to let people roll. Um, and then if, if, if the roll is terrible, swap it out for, you know, have another go. Um, nobody likes playing characters that have got really low stats. I mean, one low stat is fun because you can help that with your characterization. A whole bunch of bad rolls is no fun for anybody. Um, so there's a, there always has to be flexibility between the player and the keeper in terms of whether you let bad rolls stand, whether you let people just roll a whole bunch of dice and then assign them how they feel, or whether you say, no, that's your in roll, you stick with it. But again, this is where a session zero is really good, because if you establish that and everybody works to the same thing within the game, then there can be no sort of like petty squabbles as to well they did it that way so that's not fair because i didn't do it da, 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 da. so again creating characters together is great setting the ground rules working together so you have a coherent party and nobody's gonna get annoyed about how people's characters came to be i have one last question for you and this one's about backstory there's a lot of content you can find online where people talk about either being overwhelmed with joy or with a uh, panic about getting a deluge of, of backstory for every character or you know, being annoyed at not getting enough. Where do you fit on the spectrum? Is this a case of like, you can or you, you can't over season or, you know, or on the side of caution? What's your approach with backstory for an investigator? Oh, you can totally over season. Um, I remember running LARP um, adventures and campaigns where we used to get, you know, the, the character brief would cut, the character would come in from someone and you'd have five A4 pieces of paper double sided with their deep rich character background and it's like that's really lovely for you pet but you know there's way more information than anybody else really needs um again it's 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 going to depend on each individual person some people like to discover their backstory as they play uh and that sometimes works really well if you do let people bank points for spending um because they can that can help develop the backstory when they invest those points in a skill because it becomes a part of their backstory that never been revealed before that they've suddenly decided to share with everybody. Um, I think it helps with characterization if you have some backstory and that's why those little points on the back of the character sheet are really helpful. So you have no um, significant other treasured possession, um, you know, important location, things like that because they help you get a handle on who that person is that you're going to be playing. But you really don't need to write essays about it. I mean, if you want to in your spare time, fine, but don't inflict that on everybody else <laughs> because that's going to get in the way of playing the game. <laughs>